Cool. Hi, hello. Uh, it's very international. Peter Hoff wore his uh, clogs to denote Dutchness. I've brought my socially awkward demeanour, um, and I'm English. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, and um, in my kind of day job, I study sort of really serious things around how science gets misused and stuff in the pharmaceutical industry and spotting problems with drugs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I have this hobby which got slightly out of control, which is essentially kind of mocking morons. Um, and I know that's a really sort of unwelcome phenomenon in America. Everybody's really positive. Uh, and I really I welcome and enjoy that, and I, I find it very difficult to do it myself, but I really like uh, seeing you do it when I'm with you. Um, uh, but. Um, so there's something really interesting about science, which, um, which is that uh, although in mainstream media science is often presented in quite a triumphalist way, science is actually about critically appraising the evidence for other people's ideas. It's about disproving hypotheses. As Karl Popper here said, it's about taking the piss out of other people's ideas. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually very healthy. And um, I'm going to go to uh, uh, ultimately a, a, a quite a sad example of, of how that has failed to happen. But first, I wanted to show you some, 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 some interesting cases to, to illustrate how um, pointing out where people are wrong can actually be very informative. So uh, I write about uh, dodgy behavior in the pharmaceutical industry and dodgy government reports and misleading media stuff and also quacks. And I don't think quacks are important, right? I don't think they're bad. And I don't care about people getting ripped off. I'm not a consumer affairs journalist. I'm very happy to see it as a kind of voluntary self-administered tax on scientific ignorance. Um, <laughs> but I'll have to speak even faster if you would. Uh, but uh, uh, I, 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 I do think they can be really interestingly and informatively um, uh, wrong. Uh, so, uh, just three examples from the sort of field of nutrition to show how you can teach evidence-based medicine by showing how people have got things wrong. First up, uh, this is a lady called Dr. Gillian McKeith, PhD. She's had a, a whole string of uh, national primetime broadcast television and TV shows in the UK. She's Britain's leading clinical nutritionist, Dr. Gillian McKeith, PhD. Uh, and I first became aware of her. She says all kinds of strange things, but I first became aware of her when she uh, was being interviewed in the Radio Times and she was saying we should, eat, we should eat more dark green leaves like spinach because they contain more chlorophyll and that will really oxygenate your blood. Um, and it seemed to me sort of slightly insulting that this person should have a national television show since uh, chlorophyll, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, like from when you were 16 doing biology, uh, only makes oxygen uh, in sunlight. And it's quite dark in your bowels. <laughs> and, you know, like even if you were to stick a searchlight up your bum as part of some kind of <laughs> twisted public engagement with science experiment to test the, the scientific theories of famous TV clinical nutritionist Dr. Gillian McKeith, PhD. Uh, it probably wouldn't make any oxygen anyway because there's no carbon dioxide in there, uh, although there is lots of methane, so you probably wouldn't want to make oxygen in your bowels because that's a potentially explosive uh, combination. So they, uh, the first interesting way that people can get things wrong is just the sort of very basic sort of first principles of insultingly straightforward science. Uh, but it gets more interesting than that. So this is uh, an example from, uh, again, somebody described as sort of Britain's leading clinical nutritionist in the Daily Mirror, although she's had a complaint upheld against her by a professional body, which was brought by me, I'm sorry to say. But I was just testing to see if their systems actually worked. Um, uh, this is her writing in the Daily Mirror, which is a massive, sort of over a million circulation national newspaper in the UK. She says, an Australian study in 2001 found that olive oil in combination with fruit, vegetables and pulses offered measurable protection against skin wrinkling. So here's a claim about a piece of evidence. This olive oil and vegetables prevent skin wrinkling. Eat more olive oil by losing it in salad dressings or dip bread in it rather than using butter. So this is a sort of intervention claim. It's the sort of thing we're very used to seeing from nutritionists uh, who have a sort of interest, I think, in sort of overcomplicating and overprofessionalizing diet to create a commercial space in which they can disempower us and take our money. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this is really interesting because I went and found the paper and uh, it's a perfect teaching case for the problems with interpreting observational epidemiology. This was a whole bunch of people from all kinds of different places. They were uh, sort of Anglo-Celtic people, there were Greek people, there were Swedish people, and they measured how much olive oil they had and how many vegetables they ate and also how many wrinkles they had. And you kind of think, well, there are a lot of things that are going to vary, right, along with eating fruit and veg and having a lot of wrinkles, like how much sunlight you're exposed to, uh, and also social class. I mean, people who eat lots of fruit and veg, they're like you, right? They're posh. Don't pretend you don't have a class system in America. Um, and they're less likely to have sort of stressful lives. They're less likely to have outdoor jobs and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, so that was kind of interestingly wrong. Um, <clears throat> 
This is uh, over-extrapolating from, um, you know, uh, 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 lab data, right? This is uh, AZT, the first prescribed anti-HIV drug, is potentially harmful and proving less effective than vitamin C. And you think, what sort of evidence would I want to, to back up this quite sort of grand statement around AIDS? Um, and the answer is, you go and look, it's got a little reference in the text. Uh, this whole text that this guy has written has a kind of air of sort of referenciness, all these superscript numbers everywhere. You go and look and you find the paper, and uh, it's a paper talking about somebody dripping some vitamin C onto some HIV infected white blood cells in a dish on a bench in a laboratory. Uh, and that's it. Didn't actually mention AZT at all anywhere. So that was interestingly wrong. Um, <laughs> this, uh, uh, oh yeah, he denies that he's a vitamin pill salesman, uh, which I find bizarre. This is him. <laughs> this is, that's his face on the bottles. Uh, anyway, next. Uh, this I hope is sort of quite interesting. This is... Um, uh, a sort of a dyad of papers, if you like. This is a paper published in the British Medical Journal, which is the leading medical journal in the UK, and it's a paper describing this amazing miracle intervention that, uh, that will improve school performance and behaviour in children. And this is an amazing thing, right? And it's accompanied by a compelling cost-effectiveness analysis, and it's a gold standard randomised control trial. And was this reported in the media? Because you'd have thought, you know, this amazing miracle intervention improves school performance in children, completely ignored. And yet, at exactly the same time, throughout the entirety of the British news media, and I know you've had it here too, was this stuff about how fish oil pills improve school performance and behaviour in mainstream children. And there's never been a trial to test that. Or at least there has now, but it was negative. It didn't work. And, and, but when these stories started appearing, they were saying, uh, OK, well, we've done 20 trials before, and they've all been positive. So I got in touch, and I said, can I see these trials? Because I want to make sure that you've done these trials in the right way, because you know, not everything is a fair test. You know, I need to know that you've randomised correctly, that you've blinded correctly. And the devil is in the details. You know? And they said, oh, well, we have done 20, and they were all positive, but we can't show you, because they're secret. Um, and then I said, are you serious? Uh, and then they said, well, you can sign a non-disclosure agreement. So I might have seen them. I might not, but if I had, I wouldn't be able to tell you about it, or if I did, I'd have to kill you. Um, so that was weird, and I said, okay, well, let's just sort of think about the, the study that you've actually, that you're doing here, because they said, you know, we're doing the study, and we're very confident that uh, it's going to have positive results, and that always rings alarm bells. If you know your study's going to have positive results, then either you shouldn't do it, because we already know enough, <laughs> so don't do it, or it means, like, there's something funny about the way you've designed your trial, which means it's quite likely to have positive results. I didn't say that to him, but I did say this in my non-sarcastic voice. I said, uh, can we just follow through what you're going to do in this study? As I understand it, it's your intention to, uh, you're going to take 2,000 children, age 15, uh, you're going to give them all six of these big fish oil capsules every day, um, and then a year later you're going to measure their school exam performance and you're going to compare that against what you predicted their exam performance would have been if you hadn't given them the pills. <laughs> is that right? This is my non-sarcastic voice, and I didn't say, is that right, quite so squeakily. Um, I said, is that right? Uh, and they said... Uh, <laughs> And there was a lot of sort of prevarication, but that was right. And can anybody in the room sort of mention a reason, like, why, why is this not a good study design? And no professors of clinical trial methodology are allowed to answer this question. There's no control group. OK, but that sounds really technical and difficult to me, you know. Like, you give the kids the pills, their school performance improves. What else could it be apart from the pills, right? This is really straightforward. Belief? Belief? The, uh, the placebo effect? They got older. OK, so here's the thing. Like a while ago, you were living in nappies and you couldn't speak, and now you're really clever. <laughs> so they got older, they got better at stuff. Uh, 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 passage of time, yeah. And also, passage of time, remember, this was a poorly performing school area, and then it had lots of sort of extra effort. So maybe, you know, just by play of chance or something, or extra effort coming in, it got better. Uh, and somebody said the placebo effect. And that's really interesting, because the placebo effect is like, uh, it's not about like taking a sugar pill and getting better. It's not about a dummy pill. It's about belief. It's about belief and expectation, right? And this has been shown by a whole series of fantastic different studies comparing one kind of placebo against another. So, for example, we know that four sugar pills a day are more effective than two sugar pills a day at eradicating gastric ulcers. And that is an outrageous finding, right? And pretty binary. You know, you, it's, not, it's not like pain or itch or anything. It's like a camera down the throat. Um, so, that's amazing. We know that colour has an impact. We know that pink sugar pills make more effective stimulants. We know that green sugar pills are more effective sedatives. And the pharmaceutical industry know this. This is why Prozac comes in sort of reassuring blue and white capsules, although it doesn't really work very well, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> Uh, we know that uh, a saltwater injection in three different studies on three different types of pain, a saltwater injection is a more effective treatment for pain than a sugar pill. Not because a saltwater injection does anything physically to the body, but because it feels like a much more dramatic intervention. <laughs> And isn't that extraordinary? And isn't this really, seriously, like the true story of the relationship between the mind and the body? And isn't that so much more interesting than anything to do with like quantum made up crystal nonsense by alternative therapists? Anyway, uh, we don't have time for that. Well, we do. I mean, we have the room till 11, but uh, I have to get off. <laughs> so, uh, 
was kind of interesting, although actually sort of more interesting was the fact that at the same time they were doing this, uh, they were um, spending uh, 85 pence on the ingredients for the school meal. Sorry, 65 pence a day on the ingredients for the school meal, and 85 pence a day uh, f was the price of these pills. So if I was going to improve their diet, I know where I would start. Um, <laughs> So that's all very bad, uh, but it's kind of funny and bad. And this guy is kind of just sort of bad and bad. Um, so uh, we have a real problem in the UK with our libel laws. Um, and and uh, there have been a number of cases recently where libel laws have been used, to, to my mind, to, to silence criticism. And that's really problematic in science, because science is built on criticism, right? The whole point of science is that you critically appraise and assess other people's ideas and practices and the evidence for them. And we do this because medicine is actually quite unique and quite sinister in the sense that it's possible, even with the absolute best of intentions in medicine, to do phenomenal harm on a biblical scale. We introduce flecainide, anti-arrhythmic drugs for everybody who'd had a heart attack, with the best of intentions, on the best possible theory, by the time we worked out what a bad idea it was, it had killed over 150,000 people in America. And that is more people than died during the whole of the Vietnam War on the American side alone. But I know you're sort of imperialists, and that's what matters. Um, <laughs> but so it's possible to do enormous harm, OK? And that's really bad, right? So that's why in medicine, we have hardwired into the processes of medicine, um, basically taking the piss out of each other's ideas, OK? So every week in a hospital, you get a grand round, which is somebody presenting uh, the, a case that they found really difficult to treat. And everybody else says, well, you're an idiot. Why didn't you do an MRI instead of a CT? Obviously, you should have given erythromycin. Why didn't you do a CRP check on their blood? And that's fine. We embrace that. Academic conferences are, you know, the Q&A session after a presentation are like some kind of bloodbath, right? People tear strips off each other. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a weird aberration. We actively encourage it. It's like some kind of uh, sort of uh, consensual intellectual S&M, right? We love it. It's what we want because it's good for us. We know that, OK? Uh, and that doesn't happen if you have laws that silence debate. And there are several cases. Peter Wilmshurst, a cardiologist, who pointed out that some of the results in a trial that he personally was involved in had been presented incorrectly and is now being dragged through the UK libel courts um, and has already cost him £100,000 all of his weekends and all of his evenings for several years. And he may never get that money back. This is a man called Matthias Rath. He sued me uh, three years ago in a case that cost £535,000 to defend. I was very lucky that my paper uh, stood by me. Uh, cheerfully enough, he named me on the writ. It's still framed uh, in my toilet. Um, <laughs> We were successful in defending the case, but uh, we only received £365,000 uh, 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 of our costs. So that's a shortfall of 170000 which is roughly the price of a house. And that's the price of being correct and correctly defending a case. Um, let me tell you about this man. Uh, Matthias Rath is made in Europe and America. He's a nutritionist, he's kind of vitamin pill salesman. He uses exactly the same tricks and, and, and distortions that all of the other nutritionists, naturopaths, and whatever you want to call them, use, and some of the similar ones that I've already described. Um, but he took his ideas out of the kind of decadent Western context into an environment where things really matter. He went to South Africa. He started taking out full-page adverts in national newspapers, saying the answer to the AIDS epidemic is here. Why should South Africans continue to be poisoned by the pharmaceutical industry, he said. Antiretroviral drugs will kill you. It's a conspiracy. And the answer to the AIDS epidemic was, of course, vitamin pills. And he took these ideas to the right place. South Africa is a country where 200,000 people die every year of AIDS. That's one person every two minutes. There are 1.2 million AIDS orphans already, and it's going to get worse because more than 50% of women presenting at antenatal clinics who are pregnant are HIV positive. It's also a country that was headed for many years by an HIV denialist, President Thabo Mbeki. And interestingly, Matthias Rath's right-hand man, Anthony Brunk, personally boasts that he can take the credit for introducing President Thabo Mbeki to the central tenets of AIDS denialism. Between 2000 and 2005, the South African government variously claimed that HIV is not the cause of AIDS, that antiretroviral drugs won't treat AIDS. They refused to roll out effective antiretroviral treatment to the people who were dying of AIDS. They refused to accept gifts of money to pay for that drugs, those drugs, and they refused to accept gifts of the drugs themselves. It's been estimated that during this period, between 300 and 350,000 people died unnecessarily because of a dumb idea. Manto Shawalala Umsimang, the uh, health minister of South Africa, would appear on national television saying that uh, antiretroviral drugs were, were dangerous and that sweet African potato and garlic were the answer to the AIDS epidemic. South Africa's stall at the World AIDS Conference in Toronto was de described by other, other delegates as uh, the salad stall, because that's all it had on it. 
into this madness, only one group was campaigning, uh, uh, and, and they're called the Treatment Action Campaign, and they were fighting a war on four fronts. Uh, they were uh, a, a treatment literacy group, they were campaigning against their own government, they were campaigning against the pharmaceutical industry who refused to let people have drugs, and in fact they were running illegal drug running operations across the border to bring in drugs that people needed on the streets. And lastly, they were fighting against people like Matthias Rath. Matthias Rath didn't like the Treatment Action Campaign at all, and he bound them up in all kinds of legal cases, just like he bound me up. He also sued Médecins Sans Frontières. If you're ever looking for like a really quick and easy checklist for whether you're on like the, the wrong side, <laughs> it, it, the morning when you wake up and you find, hang on, I'm suing Médecins Sans Frontières, that's a really big clue, OK? <laughs> um, Treatment Action Campaign was headed by a man called Zaki Achmat, and he's the closest I have to a personal hero. He's uh, coloured by the racist nomenclature of apartheid, uh, uh, and he grew up in South Africa when he was 13. He burnt down his school, and if you'd been in the same situation, I would hope that you would do the same thing. He was arrested and imprisoned under that brutal and torturous regime with everything that that implies. He's also gay, he's also HIV positive, and a few years ago he started developing full-blown AIDS, but he refused to accept antiretroviral medication, despite the personal pleas of Nelson Mandela, until they were universally available to everybody in the country. Matthias Rath and his friends don't like Zaki very much, uh, and they uh, bound him up in all kinds of strange situations. It's hard to understand quite how weird the situation was in South Africa. Um, uh, they, uh, at one point, Anthony Brunk, Matthias Rath's previous right-hand man, uh, referred him to the International Criminal Court at The Hague for crimes against humanity for rolling out antiretroviral medication. Now, this sounds laughable to us, but this was reported as a serious news story throughout the South African media. I don't believe any of those journalists can have read to the end of this 70-page document, because I have, and this is what you find on the final page, after all of the usual HIV conspiracy theorist nonsense. This is his description of what he thinks should happen to Zaki Atch. In view of the scale and gravity of Achmat's crime and his direct personal criminal culpability for the deaths of thousands of people, it is respectfully submitted that the International Criminal Court ought to impose on him the highest sentence provided by Article 771B of the Rome Statute. Namely, to permanent confinement in a small white steel and concrete cage, bright fluorescent light on all the time to keep an eye on him, his warders putting him out only to work every day in the prison garden to cultivate nutrient-rich vegetables, uh, including when it's raining in order for him to repay his debt to society with the antiretroviral drugs he claims to take administered daily under close medical watch at the full prescribed dose, morning, noon and night, without interruption, to prevent him faking that he's being treatment compliant, pushed, if necessary, down his forced open gullet with a finger, or if he bites, kicks and screams too much, dripped into his arm after he's been restrained on a gurney with cable ties around his ankles, wrists and neck, until he gives up the ghost on them, so as to eradicate this foulest, most loathsome, unscrupulous and malicious malevolent blight on the human race. 535,000 pounds and 19 months of my life defending a case against people like this. Politicians criticize other politicians, doctors criticize other doctors, academics criticize other academics, and that's normal, that's, that's how it should be. What I find terrifying about this story is no single person from the alternative therapy community, from the naturopaths, from the nutritionists, the vitamin pill peddlers, not one single one of these people has come out to criticize the activities of Matthias Rath and Anthony Brunk and their friends in South Africa. I'm very happy to, to, to criticize the pharmaceutical industry, government, doctors, I do so all the time, uh, and I would have done so this evening, but I didn't want to bum you out, and uh, I'm afraid now I have. Thank you very much. Okay.